Good morning, everyone uh, on the West Coast, beginning of the afternoon here on the East Coast. Welcome to Meditation for Lawyers. I'm George Philos. Um, for those of you who were expecting mediation for lawyers, I'm sorry, this is not mediation for lawyers. Uh, invariably, we have one or two people sign up thinking that this is mediation for lawyers. If you're a mediator and you're with us this morning, I hope you'll stay uh, along. This is also not medication for lawyers. Unfortunately, we don't have, or fortunately, we don't have any, any drugs to dispense this morning, uh, but we have heard reports from uh, participants that their endorphin levels are a little pumped up by the end of the hour. So we hope you're experiencing um, uh, a good time here with us this morning. Um, I want to uh, first uh, introduce uh, Will Nickel. Will is my collaborator. You've heard his name. Um, you've heard him speak just, uh, just before. You may have communicated with him. Uh, you might hear his uh, voice uh, at times throughout the seminar if there's a technical issue. Um, so Will, uh, say hi, please. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have attorneys attending from all over uh, the country. Uh, we have attorneys from Oregon, California, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, of course, uh, here in Florida as well. Welcome. We had a uh, I'm in the Tampa Bay area. We had a hurricane that was at the last moment downgraded to a tropical depression uh, come through uh, last night and then uh, went through the north uh, central portion of Florida. I hope everyone is, uh, is okay, um, safe, uh, no property damage. Um, we have had some sporadic power outages here. So um, if you lose me, don't worry about it. Will will finish the seminar. Just just kidding, Will. Um, but if we, do, if we do have an outage, I'm going to go to my laptop and I have my personal hotspot. So there could be a break of a minute or two. I hope that doesn't happen, um, but I'm, I'm just letting you know. So we're here for meditation for lawyers. And the goal here this morning is for you and us to directly encounter our core, our source, our center, that part of us, that part of us that is, you can say it holds your essence. And why is that, why is that important? Because the happiness, the joy, the peace that is experienced, experienced when directly encountering that source, that core, is not conditioned or qualified by external circumstances. It doesn't matter what's happening in the panoply of our lives. That essential part of us remains unchanged, unperturbed. Now, anxiety could arise. Sure, we experience that. But that which experiences anxiety is not anxious. Fear arises, but that core is not afraid. There may be discord that is apparent, but it's always at peace. That's, that's the goal here. That's what we want to do this morning. Now, another goal, of course, is to relax and enjoy yourself. We've all been subject to tremendous amount of stress. Practicing law is a very uh, stressful occupation as a litigator. Um, I know that. And of course, everyone encounters stressors. We're in the age of COVID. Um, we've just gone through a very um, contentious election season that we're still that we're still going through. So I want you to really sit back, relax, enjoy yourself. 
uh, today. And also the other goal is to be able to, for you to meditate on your own. So after we go have our hour here uh, today, hopefully there's enough that you will have gained from this that you can either enhance your own meditation practice if you have one or help you start uh, your own meditation practice. So let's talk a little bit about meditation before we get into more details. Because everyone has an idea of meditation. There are so many different types of meditation. You may not meditate yourself, but people tell you different things uh, about it. So one thing I wanna make clear at the outset is that meditation is not about stopping your thoughts. And I'll repeat that again. It's not about stopping your thoughts. It's not about getting rid of anything. I once gave a meditation lecture and afterwards a young woman come up, came up to me and she had tears in her eyes and she said, thank you so much. I, I said, well, you're welcome, but, but why? And uh, she said, I've always wanted to meditate. My friends do it. I want to do it. I've tried, but I just can't stop my mind. I can't stop my thoughts. And she, of course, heard me say the same thing. It's not about stopping your thoughts. It's not about getting rid of anything. I've heard so many people say, oh, my mind is so busy. It flies a, a, a mile a minute. You can meditate. We put in our emails to you. It's easy. You can meditate. So I want you to keep this picture in mind. Let's, let's use the metaphor of a, of a large painting. There's a foreground and there's a background. The, our attention is naturally drawn to the foreground. Why is that? Relatively speaking, the figures are bigger in the foreground. They're painted in more detail. There's more action going on. There's more stuff happening. So we naturally gravitate to what's in the foreground. Now, if you're looking at this painting and you wanna notice the background, all you do is shift your focus. You don't have to eradicate the foreground in order to see the background. You don't have to paint over the foreground to notice the background. It's just a shift in focus. And that's what meditation is. Meditation is just a shift in focus where we're moving from the foreground and having the background become more apparent. We're not going to, we're not here to get rid of anything. We're not here to get rid of your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions. It's not that. So keep that, keep that in mind. So the, so the techniques and guidance that we're going to do today in this meditation is just going to help you shift that focus. And of course, that, that foreground in that metaphor for us are what grabs our attention. What's going on? You know, you're talking to someone, you're in a conversation, thoughts, feelings, sensations, you see something. That's all the foreground. And you don't have to, you don't have to get rid of that in order to ex directly experience and know your source. Now, let me just add that everyone is suited to meditation. There's no personality type. You know, if you're a type A person and say, wow, you know, we are. If you're a litigator, your attorney, you want to win in court. You put a lot into this Broadway show. You don't want it to be a flop when it premieres in the courtroom. Of course we want to win. We're, we're, we're competitive. Um, doesn't matter if you're a type A personality because you can't get anything wrong. There's no grade here. There's no, there's no wrong here. The only currency in meditation is interest. And of course you have interest because you're, you're here. It's like poker. You could sit down with a, a table with the greatest poker players in the world as long as you have money. 
and the currency here is, is interest. So let me talk, let's get through um, the business before we start to meditate and to allay any um, anticipations. We're going to do three meditation segments today each about seven minutes long. So you don't have to worry, we're gonna be sitting down for a half hour or 45 minutes in one meditation. They're going to be, they're going to be guided. Um, I may ask questions or pose questions to you uh, in the meditation. That's, um, they're more pointers, they're more pointers for you. We do have the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, there is a question and answer uh, there's a question and answer box. You can ask written questions. You can also raise your hand if you want to speak or be uh, shown or, or be seen. Oh, by the way, I can't see you. I can't hear you. You can see me. You can, uh, you can hear me. So unless you permit yourself to be heard or viewed by others, you are perfectly, um, you're perfectly private here. But I suggest that if you formulate your questions, if you have questions, you're going to send a written question. Do that. Don't do that within the meditation segments. Um, wait until the segment is over. Now, we usually run over. Um, so we will take as much time for questions and answers um, as we need. So sometimes we end up, uh, I mean, we'll end the formal program by one o'clock and we'll probably start the questions and answers before then. So if you have to go, that's fine, but you can stay as long as you want. We'll answer all the questions and you all will receive a recording of this. So if you have to leave a little bit early, then you'll have the opportunity to see the uh, entire uh, webinar. Um, This, of course, is for continuing education credit. We're accredited in Florida. We're accredited in uh, Oregon. We're eligible in, uh, you, if you're coming from New York, you're CLE eligible in New York, and we'll send you your certificate um, in order for you to get your uh, points. If you're in another state, most states have a policy in which if you take a CLE accredited in another state, um, it's fairly easy to get credit for it. You either report it as you would your own CLE or perhaps you have to uh, fill out a form. And if that's the case, we're happy to uh, assist you in that. So a couple tips before we start our first meditation. If you are, try to be in the most quiet, undisturbed place you can be. If you are in your office, shut off your cell phone. Ask your assistant, please, to hold your calls and, uh, uh, and minimize your interruptions. Um, so do the best you can. If there are distractions, that's, that's fine too, but just do your, do your best to be in a uh, quiet place. If this is lunch hour for you on, on the East Coast and you, you have something really delectable there, my advice is put it to the side. Uh, put it to the side, eat, eat when, we're, when we're concluded. You want to give your, you want to give your full uh, attention uh, to this. Now, for an outer posture, just sit comfortably wherever you are, you know, have your shoulders relaxed and down, you can move your head in a comfortable position. You can put your hands uh, on your thighs and between your thighs. You just want to be in a comfortable uh, position. I do, I do advise sitting up and kind of being erect while meditating. That's not to say that you can't meditate lying down, but our body associates lying down, slouching down with rest and sleep. So you might tend to nod off uh, if you do that. Also, I recommend in the meditations that you have your eyes closed just to minimize external uh, distractions. Also, you want to have a relaxed attentiveness. And we'll use the analogy of a camera. And a camera, you want to get that one place where the image is sharply focused. Now, if it's under focused a little, it's blurry. In meditation, that's kind of not enough attention. You can tend to nod off, daydream. So you don't want to be 
under focus. Then again, you can over focus too, and it's still blurry. That's kind of being a little too, too wired um, here. So just, or trying too much. So you just want to be in a relaxed uh, attentiveness. Now, I have a little section here on why to meditate. I'm going to pass that by because you know, you know the benefits and, or, uh, of meditation because you're here, you have an interest in it. I'll just tell you from my point of view, I've had a, I've had a meditation practice my entire life. And in times of extreme challenge, boy, has, has it benefited me? Has it come through to me? When I was litigating the Terry Schiavo right to die case towards the end of that case, we were in multiple courts at the same time. We were up and down the federal uh, appellate uh, system. We'd have appeals that we had briefing schedules to complete in, in one day, and then we were on to the next appeal on the next day. And to be, be able to remain centered, to remain within yourself, to experience the core, the peace, the relaxation, even amidst the tumult was, uh, was of great benefit, was of great benefit to me. So it's, people do other things besides meditation, there's Tai Chi, other people kind of experience, directly experience that source in different ways. For me, it's meditation. And the point is whatever vehicle you have for yourself, you want that established in your life before those extreme challenges occur. You don't want to start digging the well for water when the house is already on fire. So I'm about to stop giving you more news and, um, and details. The final thing is, this is your time. Make the most of it. Trust yourself and trust your own experience. Be like a scientist here. No matter what I say, no matter what you heard, look at the facts for yourself. And trust, and trust that. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is a, just a body centering uh, meditation. So sit comfortably. Close your eyes. And for a moment, notice the silence. Just notice the contrast of the silence to the speaking. Now just imagine, allow yourself to be the silence, to be the spaciousness. To be the expansiveness. And notice the sensation of your feet against the floor or your feet against the insole of your shoes. Just notice it. It's an appearance within the silence.
the sensation may feel tingly. You may feel a sense of pressure. It may morph or change. Just notice it. Allow it to do whatever it's going to do. There's no need to change it, guide it. It's just arising, appearing in space, in the silence. Now bring your attention to the back of your hands. The sensation of the air touching the back of your hands. It's a different type of sensation. You may feel a moistness, a dryness. A coolness. Again, just let it do what it's going to do. You may have a flash of a thought of a picture of your hands. That's not the sensation, it's just a thought. You may hear a sound. The heat or air conditioning may be blowing through the system. Just another sound, another happening within the silence, within this expanse. Now bring your attention to the breath. It may be the sensation of the muscles in the abdomen as the diaphragm pushes in and out. Or the coolness of the air as it hits the tips of your nostrils. Again, nothing to do, nothing to change. You may feel the thumping in your chest of the heartbeat. It's all just happening in the silence, in the spaciousness. And slowly, when you're ready, open your eyes. So I believe that was six minutes. That just gives you an indication of how in such a short period of time, you can deeply, deeply relax, I hope, or at least be more relaxed than you were before in such a short period of time. So now, 
as I was putting together this seminar, I, I thought, what is it as attorneys we're interested in? And the word I came, the word I came up with was authenticity. And I would define authenticity as acting from your core, your source, your center. And so why do we value that? Well, number one, because there's an element of truth, that that action stems from a source of truth. And as attorneys, we know the value of that, that authenticity is, is the most effective way you can practice, not only practice law, but do anything else. We value authenticity. We know when somebody's putting a line over us. We know when a jury, if you've done jury work, juries have a kind of a unique collective common sense. And for the most part, they know when you're giving them a line. And when you're being straight up, when you're being authentic, it's the most persuasive way you can practice, uh, you could practice law. And how, how do we know, how can we tell when someone is being authentic? Is because we're so intimately familiar with our own inauthenticity that, that we could smell it. Uh, we can sense it rather, rather easily. And there's a Rela relaxation and relief. There's a relaxation and relief in um, being authentic because you're being who you are. You don't have to. You don't have to do anything to be yourself. It's our default position, um, and you can't. You can't lose who you are because it's your default position. It stems from your source and your, your core, you don't, have to, you don't have to fake anything. And so let me give you a couple of examples of what I would call practicing law authentically and from your source. I had a criminal trial. It was my client was accused of felony battery and interference with uh, police officers. This was state prison time for him if he lost. And there were two assistant state attorneys behind me and in front of me were the witnesses and the judge. And as I was examining the witnesses, they would kind of stomp their feet, move their chair, play with rubber bands, paper clips, make annoying disturbances. And it just got a little bit out of hand. And so what to do in that moment? I could have said, your honor, I object to that. I object to the paper clips <laughs> or those rubber bands, Your Honor. Um, you know, that that, I could have done that. But what I did was, the jury was to my left. I looked to the jury, I made eye contact with them. I turned behind me to look at the prosecutors, looked back at the jury, and then just continued my examination. I didn't say a word, but that was the most, turned out to be the most effective way to address that situation. The jury knew exactly what was happening and appreciated my response. Um, no, did I plan that? Did I think that? No, it just, it just arose, it, it rose in the moment. It arose from source. Now, that, of course, that is, now that is mediated in terms of the context of the situation and our training and what we've learned. But it wasn't calculated. It was real. And uh, let me give you another example. And this was in the initial Terry Schiavo trial. I took the deposition of a witness about two weeks before the trial. She got on the stand 
her entire testimony changed. We're not talking about shades of gray, her entire testimony changed. It was, it was astounding to me in two weeks. And when the, when the judge said cross-examination, I picked up her deposition and I slammed it on the on council table. It made this big crash or thud. The, the, the judge looked, opened his eyes. The jury said, wow, boy, if Philos is doing that, something really must have happened because I'm a fairly even goer, even going mild mannered demeanor in, in court. But I didn't plan that. It was just somewhere my sense of justice, my sense of justice was offended. And that was a kind of a spontaneous, kind of surprised me, action that was appropriate to the situation and highly effective. So the more you're tuned in, the more you're living from your center, your core, the more authentic your actions are, the more effective they are. You don't have to fake anything. Um, there's, no, there's no pretense. And I call pretense the preamble to tension because if you are pretending, what's, what's happening there? You're expending, you're expending more energy to pretend to be what you're not. And there's a fear and anxiety kind of on the back burner, oh my God, what if they discover I'm really not as smart as I'm appearing to be or competent as I'm appearing to be? As, as you know, that takes a toll. That takes a toll, that, uh, that pretense. Um, and we value in our society that authenticity, that truth. I mean, as Shakespeare in Hamlet wrote, to thine own self be true. And in the common parlance, we would say, kind of get, get real. There's a societal acknowledgement of the value of that inner truth and acting from that, acting authentically. Okay, so in, in our next meditation here, we're going to, we're going to look at what does change. In, a, in, another, in another way. Um, we're going to look at the things in the foreground and by being able to see them in a more distinct way and in a, in a, in a different way that you may have looked at them before, it'll be easier for us to focus on the background which will be our final meditation. So, there are three things and only three things that appear in the foreground. They're bodily sensations. Whoops, you know, the sensation in your, the sensation of your feet against the floor, the sensation of the air against your hand. Sense perceptions, what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing, what I'm smelling, etc. And there are our thoughts. And we could almost call our thoughts subtle sense perceptions because our thoughts appear to us either visually, you can have a thought of a word, orally, that internal chatter we often hear, um, thoughts of smell, thoughts of touch. So you can call them the subtle, subtle sense perceptions. But there's only three things that appear in the foreground. So let's take a look at those in this next meditation. You are, you are doing great, by the way, you're doing really good. Now this is, this is a lot, you know, don't, this is not a typical learn how to meditate and look at your breath or something like that. This is a much different, a much um, deeper, exploration. And so don't worry about my instructions. You can listen to this when you get the recording. Just kind of, you don't have to remember anything, just kind of take it in and do your best. Okay. Might put your shoulders up and down for a moment. Okay. 
Close your eyes. Again, take a moment to notice the silence. If you want to center yourself a moment, you can feel the sensation of the feet against the floor. Notice your breath. You've already gotten a taste of that expansiveness, boundlessness, silence. Just kind of sink in, relax. The sound of my voice, that's hearing, that's a sense perception. You may hear a truck, a car outside. Again, that's hearing, a sense perception. You may feel the heartbeat, the sensation in the chest. That's a bodily sensation. You may have a thought, what am I doing taking this <laughs> webinar? It's just a thought. May feel a tingling in the body, that's a bodily sensation. Just notice how all three arise in the silence, exist for a moment, and then pass away. Ever changing, ever moving, ever morphing. They don't exist. They exist for a moment and then they're gone. But that which knows them, that which can distinguish between a thought, a sense perception, and a bodily sensation, that expanse, that silence, doesn't arise, doesn't fade away, but is always, always there. It's like those objects, the thoughts, sensations, etc., are like clouds in the sky. Constantly changing shape. Moving quickly, morphing passing through. Does it make a difference to the sky, to the expansiveness, what shape the cloud is? What color it is, whether it's gray or white or pink? The sky is the background, the backdrop that holds them all. The sound of my voice, just hearing, just a sense perception.
The thought, what am I going to do tomorrow, is just a thought. Coming and going. Notice for a moment. Is there a special place of knowing for thoughts as opposed to sense perceptions or bodily perceptions? The knowing of the sensation on the soles of my feet, does that happen in a place that's different from where my thoughts are known? where sense perceptions are known? Or look for yourself, look and see. Is that knowing unbounded, that place of knowing? And finally, from that expansiveness, from the sky, from the background. Can it ever be hurt, affected by, conditioned by what appears in it? Does the sky care whether there's a clamorous thunderstorm or a peaceful wispy cloud? Again, be that expansiveness for a moment and then slowly open your eyes. So I think you can see where this is leading. It's leading to what I said in the beginning more of a direct explore, explore, exploration, a direct encounter of that source, that core, that expansiveness, that which the foreground of our sense perceptions, our thoughts, our bodily sensations appear. And in order to talk about it, we're gonna give it a name. We're gonna give it a name and we're gonna call it awareness. You gotta call it something. They asked a fourth grade, um, a young fourth grade science student, what's a vacuum? And he says, well, a vacuum is nothing, but we give it a name so it knows that we know it's there. So for purposes of convention, we're going to call that background awareness. And so we're here in our final meditation to explore that awareness more deeply. And we do that in two ways. The first way I'll call non-interference. And again, just sit back. You don't have to remember this. These are just suggestions. So how do we interfere? Well, we interfere in by our judging, commenting upon, our likes, our dislikes, we project into the past, into the future. It's like we have a running commentary in different ways that express our likes, dislikes, preferences to what is happening. I'm going to call that interference. Now you could say, George, how, how could I ever not judge, not comment upon? Well, we're not, remember, we're not asking you to give up anything. We're not asking you to get rid of anything. Just the seeing of it neutralizes it. The fact that you say, ah, that's just commenting. That's just judging. Oh, I'm judging my judging. Well, that's, that's just more, that's more judging. Just the seeing neutralizes it. It's the resistance to the interference that puts gasoline on the fire. So the less we resist it, the more it dissipates. And it does, it does happen. People say, oh, my mind seems very restful sometimes when I meditate. When you're not 
resisting the content of your story, it just, just naturally kind of fades away from lack of, from, from lack of energy put into it. So this non-resistance to what's occurring is like in meditation, this is what happens. On your left is the resisting mind, the sediment. It's all murky. Um, as we become unattached, uninterested in the, you know, I like it, I don't like it, this or that, the sediment starts to settle. Until at the end, the sediment is at the bottom and we can see, we can see clearly. But you'll notice we didn't get rid of the contents of the jar. We just stopped agitating it. And so, again, we're not trying to get rid of it. You can't, if you put a spoon in and try to push the sediment aside, it just makes it worse. So there's a, not, that's, that's non-interference, just kind of not putting energy into the ways we usually comment interfere in in our life the universe will the universe is going to to occur and unfold and the earth will continue to spin besides be to, uh, <laughs> without our likes and dislikes being so prominent the other the other thing the other kind of posture or clue to resting in the background is welcoming. It's a kind of a benign indifference. We touched on that in the last meditation. The sky doesn't, it doesn't matter to the sky whether the, the clouds are gray or black or, or pink. If you put a blue vase in front of a mirror, it reflects a blue vase. If you put a pink vase, the mirror doesn't say, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like pink, blue's my favorite color. It equally, reflects what's put in front of it. Another analogy, which is helpful, it's like a flat screen TV. Now, you'll notice that when you're watching a flat screen TV, you forget the screen. You're so involved in the story on the screen that you don't even notice that there's a screen there. But the picture on the screen is part of the screen itself. The screen can exist without the picture on it. The picture can't exist without the screen. That's the foreground and background. So that screen doesn't care if the movie playing is a delightful romance or a, a horrific war movie with, you know, blood and gore and bombs and dismemberment. It's, it's, indifferent. It welcomes everything on the screen equally. So that's the other kind of internal posture we're looking at. It's kind of like a welcoming, a benign indifference. So what we're going to do next, and again, don't, don't be concerned that all oh, this, how can I remember too much information? This, these are just suggestions. Okay, we're going to do our last meditation now. And we're going to basically rest in awareness, in knowing, notwithstanding whatever the contents of the screen may be. Okay, last one, we're in the home stretch, you're doing great. Sit comfortably. Close your eyes. Again, sink into the posture, allow your bun to sink into the chair, the weight of the weight of your body sink into the chair. Notice the silence.
and just allow yourself, feel free to be that silence, to be that expansiveness. If thoughts come up, whether they're happy, sad, makes no difference. They're just clouds passing through. My words is just hearing passing through. Now look at that awareness, that silence. And ask yourself, does it have a boundary? Is there a limit to it? Is there a place that you can go to, like a fence or a line where this knowing, this silence, this awareness is, but does not exist on the other side? Look, search, is there any place where this awareness does not exist? Or in your experience right now, is it boundless? Is it everywhere? Is it nowhere? Can you limit it even with the with the word space, is it beyond space? Just sink into, be the boundlessness of that awareness. Is this space, this awareness, timeless or is it subject to time? Everything that appears in it has a beginning and an end. But ask yourself, has there ever been a time that you know of where this awareness did not exist? Does it have a color? Is it red? Is it pink? Certainly all colors appear in it. For that matter, does it have any shape or form? Is this awareness round or square, conical, or is it formless? form appears within it. Does it have a religious persuasion? Now look closely and ask yourself, does this awareness have a gender? Is it male? Is it female? Is it without gender? Does gender have any meaning to this awareness? This silence, this space, 
this awareness which is beyond any concept of silence, space. Is it you? Let's just take a moment to enjoy the silence. Enjoy the peace. Enjoy the happiness. Of being who you are. Of knowing who you are. And then slowly open your eyes. Okay, before we start our questions and answers, I just want to do a little business before we close. And as I mentioned before, if you have to leave it one, that's fine. That's fine. You can listen to the questions and answers when we send you the recording. I advise you to do this on a daily basis. Even if you do it five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, try it for a month and see what happens in your life. See what changes you may notice in your life. Do you get upset at things in a way that perhaps you did before? Do things bother you like they did before? Or if things don't upset or bother you, do you feel even more at rest, more at peace? We are a support for you. You can contact me at any time. You can email me. You can call me. Um, we appreciate your feedback. So if you have anything that you feel will help make this course better, then please, please let us know. On our website, we do have um, some guided meditations and our YouTube channel, George Fidelis YouTube channel, there are guided meditations. Um, there's questions and answers. There's an uh, article as well on our website. That's a resource for you. Um, also, I wanted to let you know that um, soon we're going to be having um, regular meditations, kind of a, on a drop-in basis or maybe a, a one or two month program, we're not sure, on a, on a weekly or bi-weekly uh, basis to support your meditation practice. So you can, you can drop in and you can use that as a, uh, as a support uh, as well. Um, again, it's recorded. You're gonna get you're you're gonna get it. Um, so that is, I think we are ready for uh, for questions. And oh, one other thing: if you're a member of an organization, especially state attorney, um, uh, a government attorney, public defender, large corporation, um, we can tailor a program. Uh, to you, to your specific uh, organization. I think this would be a wonderful sh thing to share um, uh, to your organization. So if you have an interest, you can email me or call me. Okay, so Will, um, do we have any questions? Does anyone want to ask an oral uh, question? Uh, we don't have any hands raised in the attendee box, but we do have a couple questions in the Q&A section. You can check okay. out. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at that. Okay, first question is from Peretz. I'd like to know the historical source of your method of meditation, religious philosophical. My interest stems from my being, in addition to a lawyer, a Hasidic rabbi that studies uh, uh, Kabbalah, uh, Kabbalah-based teachings regarding prayer and meditation. Thanks. Um, I, I don't know what I could say about a historical source. I would say that for me, 
I initially learned meditation through, um, let's say, Hindu yoga practice. I was also have done Buddhist uh, meditations for a number of years. I have also studied with some teachers who are called Advaita teachers or non-dualist teachers, which is also called the uh, direct path. So I've had training. Um, I've had training and study in those uh, in, in those methods. I would say for me, the guiding principle in this meditation, as opposed to many, many meditations, is to go directly to the source, to go directly to the core. I mean, there are many different meditations that have you focusing on your breath or staring at a candle, or I once recited the Jesus prayer um, as a meditation, uh, Lord Jesus Christ have mercy on my, uh, on my soul. And I would say for me, ultimately, as I grew the most effective way to experience the source or your core, or if you're in a religious tradition, you could use the word God, is through direct, um, direct inquiry, which is what I would call this. Okay, Marzio asks, does any particular time of the day work better? Is silence particularly important? Would you recommend home or office? Well, in the beginning, certainly being in an undisturbed location is very helpful. For me, first thing in the morning, works. And the reason for that is I found that if I didn't meditate the first thing in the morning, oh, my wife had asked me something or I would get a call or I would get distracted and I never ended up getting back to the meditation. So for me, when I established a daily meditation practice, I did it first thing in the morning. But they not, that may not work for you according if you have kids that are just coming in your room and jumping on your bed, daddy, daddy, mommy, get up, you know, I want breakfast, then that may not work for you. So once they're asleep at night, may work better. The, th the thing is the consistency. So just try to find the, the time and place that works best uh, for you. And even if it's a short period of time, interesting things happen when you do this on a sustained basis, let's say for at least a month or so, or a month or so at least I've, I experienced when I started and many other people have uh, related as well. And remember too that silence is, is better, but even if it's noisy, even if there are distractions, that's not a reason not to, not to meditate. This, the, the clouds can be fluffy and nice, they can be violent and loud. But that doesn't mean you can't experience the core. Now, in the beginning, sure, it, it may be a little bit more difficult, but stay with it. Okay, Sanford. Sanford asks, I find that whenever I meditate or do deep relaxation in yoga class, I drift off and dream. I enjoy the restfulness of it. Well, that's good. Restfulness is good. Maybe you need, maybe you need rest. Um, but re you know, remember this, which is kind of interesting. I've heard people say, you know, I kind of drift off and daydream. I lose myself. I lose myself in my thoughts. You can never lose yourself. That awareness, which is always present, is always is present in your daydream. When you realize that you were daydreaming, how can you remember what the daydream was about unless awareness was present at the time of the, of the daydream? So you never lose yourself by drifting off by daydreaming. But I would say for meditation, I know I've done yoga too. If you're in yoga nidra, which is, which is lying down, it's easy to drift off. And, but I would say for you then, if you, if you want to meditate in the way we've described here, 
put a little bit more emphasis into, into posture. And then if you're drifting off a little bit, just notice that it's just, it's just a bodily sensation. And ask yourself the question, does that which realizes I'm drifting off, is that tired? Is that awareness tired? Is it sleepy? That you can kind of stoke your interest in that process of relaxation, restfulness, drifting off, whatever that is for you. And I would submit to you and posit to you that you can directly encounter your core and be fully aware, no matter how, to what extent your body mind the, uh, is drifting off or is resting. Kevin asks, how can you apply the meditation practice in combating issues of confrontation? That's a really, really pertinent question to practicing law. Because trial work, by the way, I call it ritualized combat. Because in the Anglo-Saxon legal tradition from which our legal tradition stems, when you had a boundary dispute with your neighbor, they picked their champion and you picked your champion and they literally had clubs and they, they entered combat and who was ever, who was ever left standing won the, won the case. So yes, there's those il el elements of of, of combat. And this is, doesn't have to do with meditation. I'll just find for myself, which is a little perhaps wisdom of being at the end of my career. When I started my legal career, I was much more combative. And in part of being combative was combating my adversary. And I learned that the most effective way in litigation and practicing law is recognizing for every witness, for every judge, for every, you know, every party, every attorney, their inherent worth. We could say that the knowing or awareness that is the core of their being is no different or the same as that is, that's in our being. Now, in Combating issues of confrontation. There's two levels that you're dealing with. And we talked about this about practicing law authentically. You have a situation which demands an action. Now, from where does that action arise? If you're angry, at the other attorney or the other person, or you're, you're resisting, we can call it anger is a, is a type of uh, resistance. You're irritated. Somebody has insulted you. If you're acting from your, if you are reacting from your resistance to the situation, well, then you're going to create more resistance, more, confront, more confrontation. If you're not reacting, but you are responding from source, then you do what is appropriate. And the more you meditate, the more you find that you're able to respond rather than react. You're more able to do the action that is appropriate to the situation. And what is appropriate may, could be yelling, could be, who knows, if you're, in the, if you're in the supermarket and you see somebody, you know, beating up a two-year-old, you know, the appropriate reaction may be just to scream and say, you can't do that, stop that. So we're not talking about a passivity here. 
we're talking about responding from source authentically, which means doing what's needed to be done without getting into your own stuff and your own, you know, they can't say that about me and, you know, they're being mean to me and, you know, that sort of stuff. You know, there you're reacting as a person, you're reacting as a personality as opposed to responding for source. And the ability to do that, the ability to be more, to act authentically um, increases as you meditate. Okay. Perrette says, thank you. So I guess the answer is Eastern religion. Well, and, and Peretz asked me the question about the historical philosophical source. I can tell you what led me to this place, but let's not forget some of the questions I asked you in the final meditation. Does that awareness have a religious persuasion? Does that awareness have a philosophy? Or does do religions, do religious, does dogma, does belief arise, arise in it? So in, 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 in some way, yes, that's what brought me here. But in, in the essence of what we're doing, you could even say it's not spiritual. It's not, um, it's not religious. And um, so that's just another way uh, to look at it. When John asks, when self-guided, how do I know when to stop? Well, a couple things. If you find that you're doing something rotely, you're doing it kind of in an automatic way. You're not enjoying yourself. That's a good place to stop because this, this is not a practice. Remember I said that the currency, the currency of meditation is an interest. So sometimes we're not interested. You know, if you're not interested in meditating or you were interested and now you're not, maybe it's time to put the basketball game on or have an ice cream or something like that. And that's that's perfectly, that's perfectly fine. I would just trust, trust yourself. If, you know, sometimes obstacles or what we deem as obstacles may occur and they're there for you to see them in a different light or to see them what they are, as they are, and to see that they're really not obstacles. So I think you just need to trust, trust yourself, but the, the, the abiding thing is that if you're interested, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating thing, that inner exploration. If you're interested, then keep going. If you're not interested anymore, it's become rote, then I would say it's a good time uh, to stop. Marzio asks, is one of the goals to make meditation sessions longer? What would be the optimal time? That's kind of a little bit, kind of a follow-up to John's question that we just responded to. I've meditated for an hour and 15 minutes. I've meditated for 10 minutes. Did, did one have more benefit than the other? Um, I would say that at least having a minimum time to start with, you know, when you're learning a new task, that's why you practice the piano, you do scales in the beginning and you have to do, if you're just not gonna do them, you're probably not gonna learn how to play uh, the piano. So, you know, if you do it every third day, you only do it for five minutes or something like that. The chances of you getting the, the hang of it, let's say, because it's a little bit of an, uh, an art here a little bit of an art, a little bit of a skill, will be more difficult. So I think if you have the time, a good time would be 20 minutes. If you can meditate, 
let's say 15, 20 minutes on a daily basis, that's uh, a good place to start. And if it turns out that you have more time and you're interested, that's, that's great. So in the beginning, having a minimum time, I think is helpful. Once you've done this for a while, it's just, you, can, you, you, you know, but as you're acquiring a skill, those external gu guidelines, I think uh, could be helpful. Okay. Um, Robert asks, can you meditate standing up? Yes, you can. You can meditate standing up. You can meditate lying down. Um, sometimes if I were physically, when I took a meditation program at a meditation retreat where they have schedules and you're doing it, if I found that I was tired or drifting off, I would stand up because it's, <laughs> it's a little harder to, you don't want to fall over. You're a little bit more alert when you're standing up. So yeah, you can, you can meditate standing up. The thing, you can meditate when you're on the bus. You can meditate when you're on the line at the grocery store. Remember, it's just when, you watch, when you're watching your flat screen TV, at any moment, you can still watch the program, but see the screen. And that may be like an interesting practice. You can be aware of the screen and the program at the same time. The foreground doesn't have to take all your attention. And so in essence, the more that we're used to being grounded in the background, we're in essence meditating all the time, standing up, sitting down, online, on the phone, because there's a part, there's a part of that attention that is never fully captured by the foreground. We're not adrift, we're always kind of anchored. And the more you meditate, the more you feel that anchoring. So you can, you find that you are basically connected in that way all the time. And that is, that's a joy. And that's a blessing, that's a blessing too. You know, it's not that you don't get hit or knocked in our relative life, but it's like, you know those big dolls, those punching bags that have like sand at the bottom, you can give them a big whack and they tip all the way over, but they spring right back because their center of gravity is low. Yeah, so of course we wobble. And if somebody says, hey George, you're the biggest jackass in the world. I'll say, whoa, you know, what's that? But I mean, do I, do I cry? Does I, do I get depressed for a day or two? No, it's just, just an appearance. It's just, you know, thoughts and sense perceptions. So yeah, we become grounded in that way. And so we, we end up kind of being meditative all the time. Okay, John asks, John asked about when do we know when to, when self, when self guided, how do I know when to stop? Sorry, I didn't, he, he says now as a follow up, sorry, I didn't, I'm sorry, I meant in a particular session, exactly like this question. Good stuff, okay, minimum time, set an alarm, a quiet one. Yeah, my wife has a little thing on her iPhone. It's like a, when she meditates sometime and it, it's like a gentle, gong you, you hear three gongs so it's it's uh it's nice sheldon asks housekeeping questions just to confirm all participants in this webinar can obtain a tape video audio of this entire webinar yes now you don't have to go through will for a copy of it i will email you i will email you the webinar recording. So you don't have to do anything. Usually within a couple of days, we send out the um, uh, email. So you'll have the link to the recording um, within a couple of days. So you don't have to do anything to get that. And do you have to go through Will for documentation for participation in this webinar? 
Yeah, when I send out the um, recording, I will also send out the course number, the CLE course number for Florida. So you all can just go online in Florida and you just enter the credits yourself. I'll send you the MCLE number for Oregon. And so if you're in another state, not New York, but another state where you just can enter those on, you'll have the, uh, on your own CLE, um, you'll have those course numbers. For the New York attorneys, we need, I believe, your email address and your bar number and your physical address. But, but in our email to, you, to the New York registrants, we will tell you exactly what you have to send to us and then Will will send you the um, certificate. So we'll give you instructions for that um, when, you, when you receive the recording in a couple of days. Oh, another question popped up here. This is from Maria. Do you recommend any other videos or teachers for beginners, particularly for helping overcome professional anger and irritation? I am an immigration attorney and we deal with a lot of unfair practices from the government. Well, I, I hear you, Maria. I had, um, I had a tax refund case uh, many years ago in which the Department of the Treasury, IRS, the Justice Department were on the other side and we had a jury trial in federal district court and it was, it was very frustrating I, mu I must say, working with the federal, with the federal government, because the the assist the the Justice Department of Attorney had this kind of air of um, imperiousness to him. So um, that's what happens when you have a lot of uh, power. So anyway, Maria, I can relate that. As far as other videos or teachers. There's a lot out there on the internet. There are, as far as teachers, I would say, give it a try and see who resonates with you. Who's, who's helpful. You might find something and say, this just doesn't work for me or just have a feeling, no, I don't, um, that's not for me. So you can try different, uh, different videos. Uh, I will say though, that through other teachers and other videos, you may not find the type, the meditation that we do here, um, which is more of a direct path and inquiry. Um, you might try some, what are called non-dual teachers, if you're interested in this type of meditation. You may, as I said before, um, find resources on our uh, website and I hope if you know we're giving these on a regular basis that you'll be able to pop in. So you know use your obviously when you start to when you start to meditate uh, you don't lose your discernment and so um, with what's out there in the marketplace um, you're a user you're a consumer you do what feels uh, appropriate to you and what feels right and beneficial uh, for you. So Will I think that um, that does it for the questions. I just want to end by saying thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a, uh, an honor and a privilege uh, for me uh, to be able to be with you uh, today. And so, Will, um, goodbye from me and goodbye from Will, and I hope we see you soon. Take care.